Hello everyone, happy Douglas week to you all and a happy Black History Month to everyone watching in the US. And if you're joining us live, happy Valentine's Day, happy Frederick Douglass's birthday, so plenty to celebrate today. My name is Sarah McCready, I'm one of the co-founders of Douglas Week, and we want to thank you for tuning in today, here live on YouTube, to this wonderful event. With me today is my amazing colleague and friend and Douglas Week founder, Dr. Caroline Schroeder. Hi Caroline. Hello, Sarah, and uh, a happy Valentine's Day to you. A happy birthday to Frederick Douglass and a happy Black History Month and a happy Douglas week. <laughs> it's really lovely to be with you today. And of course, hello, everyone watching. Um, a warm welcome to you and also to our speaker, John Muller. Um, thank you all for joining us today. As I said, happy Douglas week. It's day five already. And um, yeah, if you didn't know, um, like Sarah said, Frederick Douglass's birthday is today, his chosen birthday. And uh, we've been learning so much about Douglas and his family and their lives the whole entire week, really and uh, we can't wait to hear more uh, that's exactly what we're going to do we're going to hear more today so we are excited that you have all joined us for this event today which is called frederick douglas and the black press in dc and this is with john miller a local historian in washington dc we're going to hand over to john in a little minute but first we want to tell you just a little bit more about douglas week Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, I'm sure that everyone at this point probably knows um, about Douglas Week and that we've created it to celebrate um, and also to commemorate um, the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass and everything that he stands for. Uh, and of course, other change makers as well. We always say that Fred Douglass is kind of the, the kickoff point for conversations and for performances and for discussions and reflections. Um, but we also, and you know, we, we don't just want to commemorate the history of Douglass and, and his wonderful big family, but it's also about, Douglas Week is also about um, a lot of the kind of contemporary issues um, back then and that still resonate today um, that we want to talk about um, issues with identity and race, um, you know, freedom, independence, and, and kind of equal rights, um, kind of the struggle around the world. And all of those come up when you talk about Frederick Douglass. And we want to also, we want to do that on the one hand. And on the other hand, we want to celebrate some of the guiding uh, principles that were guiding principles for Douglass but also for us here at Douglas Week. So, you know, something like connectedness, um, co-creation, collaboration. Um, and that's something that I think all of our contributors, our partners, our supporters, and our friends here at Douglas Week share. Yes, Caroline, well said. And I think the Douglas community has grown so much since we started Douglas Week in 2019. We can't wait to see this grow more. So thank you for tuning in. Um, before we begin this event now, there's just, just a few small things that we want to note in terms of housekeeping. So this event will probably be around 45 minutes. And if you have any questions, you can submit them through our chat here on YouTube. We will be monitoring that and we'll do our best to pass on all your questions to um, John Miller, our speaker today. And finally, just to say, we ask everyone to please be respectful of, to our panelists and other audience, audience members. Um, inappropriate conduct will not be tolerated. So thank you very much, everyone, for understanding and being respectful. Yes, thank you so much for, for being respectful, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and uh, just a note for our audiences, um, all of the events um, that you can see here on our, our YouTube channel, you're doing it right, you're here, are you joining us live or you're re-watching this event. Um, all of the events that happened during Douglas Week um, last year and uh, that are happening this week, um, they have been recorded and they will be available after Douglas Week. So if you miss an event, um, don't worry you can you can watch it back um, and the other thing if you want to learn more about what we do at Douglas week um, what we'll do next year uh, and what's coming up um, we had to postpone a couple of events um, just because of the very tricky situation challenging times that we all face right now um, all of the information you may need and our program and uh, all the people that are participating everyone who is part of Douglas week last year and this year um, all of that information you can find on our website, and that's www. 
douglasweek.org. So um, now <laughs> that we've told you all of that, um, without further ado, um, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, John, for being here. Thank you, Sarah, for co-hosting with me. And uh, a very happy Douglas Week to everyone. And I hand over to John Muller now. Thank you for being here, John. Wonderful, thank you so much for having me. Uh, yes, just as a, a, a little note, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty, so we will try to power through this presentation and share with you some insights on Frederick Douglass as editor emeritus of the Black Press in Washington, D.C. Uh, so this is uh, day five of Douglass Week. I've had the distinct honor to present on Frederick Douglass and sports. Uh, the Frederick Douglass and Shakespeare presentation had to be delayed to a uh, future uh, uh, to be determined date, but we are gathered here uh, this morning in Washington, D.C., and wherever uh, time it is in the time zone you are tuning in from, we are glad to have you with us. All right, so Frederick Douglass lived in Washington, D.C. from 1870 to 1895. During that period of time, he was a publisher and editor of the New National Era, uh, which was published from 1870 to 1874. I will get into that in uh, just a moment, but also uh, of a historical significance and consequence was his role as a mentor and advisor to the younger generation of journalists, editors, publishers, some photos here, we see John Edward Bruce, who is known as Bruce Grit. He was a pretty radical uh, fellow who had some public disagreements with Mr. Douglas. You'll see Ida Wells, which our friends in Europe may be familiar with as Ida Wells toured uh, England in the 1890s. Frederick Douglass had sent letters of recommendation in advance of her arrival, asking his old abolitionist friends if they would receive her with the same hospita hospitality in which they had received him. Uh, to the bottom underneath Mr. Douglas is radical T. Thomas Fortune, who was a uh, pioneering journalist and author. All right, I am controlling these panels from a separate, okay, wonderful. So uh, for those of you who are tuning in from Washington, D.C., you may be familiar with the Washington Informer, established 1964. It's published today by the founder's daughter, Honorable Denise Rolark Barnes, who is pictured there to the right. I've had the distinct pleasure to contribute uh, reporting newspaper articles, uh, as well as an occasional kind of history essay to the informer for uh, on and off for the past 10 years or so. My co-collaborator, Mr. Justin McNeil, who's unable to join us this morning, has also contributed bylines to the informer. The informer is published every Thursday in Washington, D.C. Uh, it, along with the Afro is one of the two um, black press newspapers in Washington, D.C. Interestingly enough, the New National Era was published on Thursday. It says connection loss, attempting to reconnect. Hopefully we are still, we are still live. Okay, so the historical legacy of Frederick Douglass as a uh, newspaper publisher and editor uh, remains alive today in the daily work of the Washington Informer, which you can follow on Twitter uh, and Facebook. All right, who am I? I am the author of Frederick Douglass in Washington, D.C., The Lion of Anacostia, which was published in October of 2012. I've led walking tours of Old Anacostia for several years now. Uh, there are two images uh, specifically of some of those walking tour groups. I have had the opportunity to present on Frederick Douglass in Washington, D.C., as well as his relationship with uh, the Lincoln family and other topics of interest uh, that has been broadcast by C-SPAN. I don't know if our friends in Europe get C-SPAN, but it's a very popular station for history nerds like myself here in the USA. All right. Here are uh, photographs, actually, from very recent 
walking tours that were kindly supported by Douglas Week 2022. To the left is the Honorable ANC AA Commissioner Robin McKinney welcoming uh, the tour group on 14th Street, Old Pier Street and Old Anacostia. When Frederick Douglass would welcome journalists to the neighborhood, such as Jane Marsh Parker, he would walk the community. And there was a very famous uh, profile that she wrote on Mr. Douglass, and she was walking on 14th Street, which is where the picture to the left is taken. Uh, to the right is a gentleman looking at the inscription on the Friedman Memorial or the Emancipation Memorial in Lincoln Park also known as Emancipation Park at 11th and East Capitol Street in Washington, D.C. That was uh, on Saturday's walking tour of Frederick Douglass in Capitol Hill, which was part of Douglass Week. All right, here is another photo that was taken yesterday due to the closure on Sundays of the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site. Uh, we had to improvise and therefore we ascended to the top of a nearby residential street and took in the panoramic view of Washington, including the Capitol Dome, Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress. And these are uh, photos from tours that were uh, supported in part by Douglas Week 2022. We encourage and invite all of our European friends or friends from out of town when they come to Washington, D.C., please connect with us and we'd be We'd be glad to take them uh, around to some of the sites and historic places uh, with residual consequential connections to Frederick Douglass. All right, so the new national era was published in Washington. Uh, that is actually a typo on the top, please forgive. It's published from 1870 to 1874. That is the uh, kind of the watermark of the new national era, published weekly in Washington, D.C., Frederick Douglass, editor of the Douglass Brothers Publishers. The two Douglass children that were the publishers are Frederick Douglass Jr. to the left, Lewis Henry Douglass to Frederick Douglass Jr.'s right. You'll then see in the middle is Richard Theodore Greener, the first Black American graduate of Harvard University. He was involved uh, with the newspaper. Mary Ann Shad Carey was also a contributor to the new national era. And then you'll see Mr. Frederick Douglass to the right. At this time, there was no black press newspaper published in Washington. This was prior to the Washington Bee, prior to the People's Advocate, prior to the Colored American, prior to the Washington Informer. All right, the new national era uh, had subscription agents all over the country. It would advertise uh, current publications. Some may be familiar with William Still's History of the Underground Railroad, published in 1872. So there were advertisements in the new national era seeking subscription agents for William Still's 1872 History of the Underground Railroad. You'll see to the far right is the front page of the New National Era. Like I said, it was published weekly from January 1870 to the fall of 1874. There were advertisements for uh, classes at Storer College in Harpers Ferry. There were advertisements for Howard University in Washington, D.C., and it would chronicle local news, regional news, national news, and even have dispatches from Ireland and Paris about international news. All right. Let's see if this works here. Okay, uh, another significant element of the new national era was its chronicling and documenting the first generation of Black American United States congressmen and United States senators. From 1870 to 1901, there are 21 Black Americans to serve in the United States Congress and United States Senate. 
Some of these individuals, uh, there's not very much known about their uh, biographies, and some of these gentlemen, what we do know, is taken from profiles that were written in the new national era. The custom of the day was that when these gentlemen arrived to Washington, D.C., from the southern states of America, they would seek out Frederick Douglass's home on Capitol Hill and or his newspaper office on 11th Street, and they would be interviewed, and the new national air would say, we'd like to welcome to Washington, D.C., Jefferson Franklin Long, let's say, who was elected from Georgia, and there would be a profile on uh, these individuals, these gentlemen, and... Um, it was very important in the new national era to chronicle the uh, the groundbreaking congressmen and senators. All right, Douglas home on Capitol Hill. I don't know how many have been to uh, this house. I don't know if you're on YouTube and you can make a comment, uh, but I'm sure some people have been past this house before. It's right behind the United States Supreme Court right around the corner from the United States Capitol. Serving as the DC home of Frederick Douglass from 1872 to 1877, the home was a gathering place for Howard University students, local ministers, artisans, writers, foreign diplomats, congressmen, senators, Supreme Court justices, postmaster generals, cabinet secretaries, and other leading officials of the day, including journalists. Admission into the inner circle of the Douglas family upon his arrival in Washington City, uh, where this is this was actually taken from a presentation uh, that I adapted about T. Thomas Fortune. So his is T. Thomas Fortune. Admission in, into the inner circle of the Douglas family upon uh, folks arrival in Washington City facilitated members of the Black press to form and develop their own alliances and relationships independent of the influence of Frederick Douglass. One particular individual that we will feature is George Washington Williams. George Washington Williams was the focus of a biography published by John Hope Franklin, the preeminent black historian of 20th century America. George Washington Williams was portrayed by Samuel L. Jackson in the movie, I guess it was like the lost Tarzan or uh, recent Tarzan iteration, and Samuel L. Jackson is portraying George Washington Williams because when George Washington Williams was in Africa, he wrote about the human rights atrocities that were happening in Congo and had uh, was very critical of King Leopold, and a New York daily newspaper published George Washington Williams' dispatches, and he brought international attention an outcry to the abuses that were happening in uh, present day Congo. All right, now this gentleman, before writing about King Leopold, he started a newspaper in Washington, DC. It's called The Commoner. And you can see that all money orders and letters on business must be directed to the editor of the Commoner 316 A Street Northeast care of Honorable Frederick Douglass until further notice. So not only did Frederick Douglass allow gentlemen such as Blanche Bruce to lodge in their in his in his DC home, but he allowed enterprising young journalists to essentially use his home as their office, as, as, as opposed to having a P.O. box or a uh, co-shared workspace, Mr. Douglas allowed Mr. Williams to essentially use his home as a place that he could uh, help to start and transact, transact a business to assist this paper. All right, John W. Cromwell. Started a newspaper called The People's Advocate in 1876 in Alexandria, Virginia. Its office was changed to Washington, D.C. Mr. Cromwell was its proprietor and editor uh, for 14 years of uninterrupted publication. Mr. Frederick Douglass would write under a um, basically an alias or pseudonym 
uh, M, D, M of DC, Marshall of DC, Frederick Douglass would write editorials to the People's Advocate. Mr. Cromwell served on the board of Store College in Harpers Ferry, in which Frederick Douglass was closely affiliated with. The People's Advocate was published on 7th Street, Washington, DC. Some may know that area and its historicity uh, from Langston Hughes, the Harlem Renaissance, Gene Coomer, uh, uh, Gene Toomer, excuse me, Zora Neale Hurston, and others who chronicled the culture and society of 7th Street Northwest, which is uh, just due south of Howard University. So Mr. Douglas was friendly with Mr. Cromwell. Mr. Cromwell was the gentleman who gave T. Thomas Fortune the opportunity to get involved in journalism when T. Thomas Fortune was a student at Howard University. All right, this is a little background on T. Thomas Fortune within the interest of time, we are not going to spend any more time on this other than you can briefly see this slide. Fortune was a very radical journalist that Douglas had a very close relationship with. All right. So not only did Frederick Douglass uh, befriend editors and publishers and contribute to their papers, as well as occasionally send a letter of endorsement to say that I have just renewed my subscription to the People's Advocate, and I encourage others to do so. These documents are essentially receipts demonstrating Frederick Douglass's yearly subscription. I believe this is from 1883, uh, yearly subscription to Mr. Cromwell's paper for $2. And there's a newspaper clip that Mr. Douglas with Mr. Cromwell were headed to Richmond, Virginia, where they met with the editor of the Richmond Planet, John W. Mitchell. All right. Following uh, the Civil War and in the mid 1870s, a colored press association was established uh, today. The NNPA is the National Newspaper Publishers Association. Uh, we do not have represent. We we try to reach out to um, to other journalists in DC to be on this call, but their schedules did not did not align. So I apologize if I misspeak. But the NNPA, which is essentially a membership organization of Black press newspapers in the country, I believe it's about 110, 120. Uh, participating newspapers. Some of these have shifted to online, uh, but there are about 100 uh, news, Black newspapers uh, that are in the United States today. And the NNPA, histor historically, its origins are in the Colored Press Association, which was organized in the mid-1870s. Here is a newspaper clip of their meeting in 1882 when they met in Washington, D.C. As a nascent organization founded nearly a decade earlier to bring together journalists from across the country, in 1882, the Colored Press Association met in Washington City. The meeting drew its, to date, most robust and distinguished attendance, including members of the old abolitionist newspaper editors who had been runaways alongside young men such as T. Thomas Fortune, who had attended universities founded following the Civil War. Okay, some of the attendees of the Colored Press Association in 1882 were Reverend Francis J. Grimke, who married Frederick Douglass or officiated his second marriage. Mr. Grimke was an associate of Carter G. Woodson, who founded Negro History Week that became Black History Month. And you'll see on the bottom, it says, among those presents were Professor Richard Theodore Greener, who I mentioned earlier, Mr. Douglas and uh, Alexander Cromwell. I believe they mean uh, John W. Cromwell, but nonetheless. And there's other uh, attendees, Bishop uh, Tanner, and it should say Mr. H.L. Barnett, which is actually Ferdinand Barnett, who married Ida B. Wells, hence Ida B. Wells Barnett. All right. 
Among the attendees of the 1882 Color Press Association were William Calvin Chase of Washington City and Ferdinand Lee Barnett of Chicago. Chase would prove to be uh, T. Thomas Fortune's antagonist for more than 40 years within the pages of the Black Press as well as in Republican Party politics. Uh, Frederick Douglass kind of helped to facilitate and be a mediator between some of the disputes and disagreements that the younger members of the Black press had uh, with each other and with each other's editorial positions. All right, so T. Thomas Fortune founded the New York Globe, and he would frequently uh, have spats with the Washington Bee, which was published by William Calvin Chase. And as I mentioned, Frederick Douglass on several occasions uh, tried to facilitate and mediate disagreements between uh, the younger generation. All right, William Calvin Chase. He was a close ally of uh, Mr. Douglas, but they also had some public disagreements. Mr. Chase, out of his uh, newspaper office at 1109 I Street Northwest, which is essentially 11th and I Street, he would publish uh, in pamphlet form Frederick Douglass's speeches. You can see just out four great speeches of Honorable Frederick Douglass. In the middle is a photograph from the Library of Congress of the um, Washington Bee's offices. So the top right is the distinguished gentleman, William Calvin Chase. And on the bottom is a document uh, with the letterhead of the Washington Bee. And this is Mr. Chase sending uh, just a simple letter to Mr. Douglas. All right, here is a profile of, quote, the colored press by the Philadelphia Times from 1886. Something about newspapers owned and edited by the Negro race. Such a phrase as the colored press would scarcely be understood in any other land than the United States. To speak of a colored press in England or on the continent would be to awaken an idea of a paper printed on colored material or some such real thing. With Americans, however, it is entirely different. They know precisely what is meant. American caste has created a nomenclature peculiar, peculiar, peculiar to itself. The colored, the colored press in the United States is the press owned, published, and edited by colored men and women, and usually all the literary contributions are emanations of the brains of members of the Negro race. Continuing on, there are today in the United States 150 newspapers and magazines published by men of color. Four men, including the editor, usually make up a company of owners, but the editor is the only person who devoted his time to solely to the business. He acts in the capacity of editor, manager, publisher, and sometimes advertising agent. The other members of the firm are employed in stores and private families. The New York Freeman, its circulation is estimated at 4,000 copies per week. The Freeman is the political organ of the colored race and regarded as a terror to Southern bourbons. These two journals enjoy the proud ones of being the only ones published by colored men who have a national reputation. They're known from Maine to California. There are five compositors, all colored, who receive about $15 a week. There's also one proofreader whose business is to set type, read proof, keep books, and attend to the business correspondence. All right, here's another meeting of the Color Press Association, this time in Atlantic City, New Jersey. When these conventions were held, Mr. Douglas was very deliberate in attending these conventions and he would frequently address uh, the gathering and he would frequently uh, in share words of inspiration, speak about his experiences running the North Star newspaper prior to the Civil War. And he would also frequently orient his remarks to the politics of the day. You can see it says on the bottom, Frederick Douglass arrived here tonight and will address the convention tomorrow. Okay, here's just a further close up of that press clip, which I will move forward. All right, once again, uh, talk a little bit about um, 
T. Thomas Fortune and William Calvin Chase. <laughs> to the left, it says the uh, aesthetic crank of color journalism is T. T. Timothy Weed Fortune of the Freeman. He is chagrined with us because we knocked him out of the presidency of the Color Press Association. The, ble the best place for fortune is the lunatic asylum. So you can see that they uh, these editors did not uh, uh, hold their tongues or uh, they did not restrain their fingers in uh, kind of using strong language towards each other. And Mr. Douglas, when he would see this, uh, he would frequently write a letter to these editors, essentially saying that they really should cool uh, some of the rhetoric because they were all the all these colored editors and publishers and newspapers were working to advance the race and advance progress, and it did not help by uh, <laughs> by focusing their ire on each other. All right. Okay, another uh, distinction of the black press was they would, uh, editors and publishers would frequently profile and feature um, the accomplishments and groundbreaking achievements of women. So just here briefly, uh, this is from T. Thomas Fortune's paper, and he uh, chronicles women of color, what some of them have done who have had advantages. So he would, uh, these are mostly educators that are featured and we can see on the bottom it says Marion Shad, who is convoked to Mary Ann Shad Carey. And there is Miss Martha Briggs uh, in the middle, Charlotte Ford Grimke and some other um, educators that are featured here. All right. So I also say uh, that there were some radical white lady journalists that Mr. Douglas was uh, friendly with. And these were journalists who all were, um, they devoted space in their columns and newspaper reportage to advance civil rights, to advance uh, the causes of the freedmen community following the Civil War. To the left is Grace Greenwood, Sarah Jane. Grace Greenwood was her pen name. Sarah Jane Lippincott was her birth name. She was the first woman to have a regular column in the New York Times. She, on several occasions, uh, defended Mr. Frederick Douglass against uh, criticism uh, and speculation, and she was a uh, very close confidant to Mr. Douglass. In the middle is Kate Field, who ran her own newspaper in Washington. She was a frequent visitor and guest at Cedar Hill. And to the right is Mary Clemmer Ames, who is another a uh, journalist who was very supportive actually of black education and frequently chronicled um, black, uh, which are known as HBCUs in her reportage. All right, this is just a view of W Street in Old Anacostia looking up at Cedar Hill. And this is a view that many journalists would have seen with uh, Sands the Fence when they would visit Mr. Douglas in Cedar Hill. One of the journalists who visited Frederick Douglass, uh, as well as T. Thomas Fortune and other black journalists was this gentleman, George Alfred Townsend. George Alfred Townsend was a white journalist who was friendly to uh, uh, civil rights issues. And you'll just highlight on the bottom bolded quote that he wrote, Frederick Douglass comes from the Eastern shore of Maryland and has a good oystery nature about him. He opens up well. All right, so Cedar Hill, uh, see the front porch here. Uh, frequently journalists would just descend upon Cedar Hill. Sometimes they would be, uh, their, they, their arrival would be expected. Other times they would go to Cedar Hill when there was a recent political scandal or some sort of issue and they sought Mr. Douglas's comment and uh, insight and perspective. And one of the journalists who was a frequent presence at Cedar Hill was Ida B. Wells. She was uh, several years Mr. Douglas's junior. She was born in 1863. And when she was just in her late 20s and very early 30s, 
Mr. Douglas helped to secure um, her accommodations to speak out against lynching or extrajudicial violence in the American South. And she took her cause to England where she was well received. And to the left is a letter that Miss Wells writes to Frederick Douglass. And I believe that Frederick Douglass was uh, very integral to introducing Ferdinand Barnett was a black newspaper editor of Chicago to his friend uh, Ida Wells and Ida Wells and Mr. Barnett later married. All right. Here is Mr. Douglas in his library in Cedar Hill. And here are some young Douglasonians from the neighborhood gathered on the front step. I think that are, Okay, this is the last slide that I have. So not only was Frederick Douglass an editor, publisher, uh, but he was an active reader. He subscribed to several local newspapers, daily, weeklies, monthlies. This is from May 1894, when Douglass is describing to the very hyper-local Anacostia Press, which was published on Harrison Street, which is today Good Hope Road. And that concludes my very brief presentation on Frederick Douglass and the Black Press in Washington, D.C. If there are any questions or comments, I'd be glad to uh, take them. I see, did each of these papers have their own printing presses or do they pull their resources to print? That is a wonderful question. Um, today, frequently, the same uh, printing warehouses, for example, in DC, the uh, Baltimore Sun is printed in Delaware. Uh, the same company that prints the Washington Times prints the Washington Post. Back in these days, these offices all would have had uh, essentially manually operated printing presses. So they would have all been, uh, the, the, the type set would have been set in-house and they would have been published in-house. Uh, the kind of modern printing warehouses and distribution mechanization is kind of a more modern uh, industrial development. Uh, that's a wonderful question. Were there any photos of Cedar Hill when he lived there? Um, yes. Uh, there are photos of Mr. Douglas on the front step with his massive dog named Frank and the photo of Douglas in the library. Uh, his dog is actually on the floor kind of at his feet. And uh, that was, I don't know the exact date. That was probably about the 1890s that that photo was taken. Um, okay. I don't know if there were any YouTube questions or comments, but uh, this was a fun presentation. Thank you so much, John. Um, it's been so lovely to, to have you um, and to hear more insights and information about Frederick Douglass. We're always just so blown away by the richness of the material in your presentation. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for tuning in on YouTube. Happy Douglas week, everyone. And I'll just hand over to Caroline to just say a few words about some of our remaining events today on day five. Yeah, thank you also from me. Thank you so much uh, for uh, the questions uh, on YouTube, um, everyone. Thank you, John, for this really wonderful and insightful um, presentation. I really love all the research that you uh, are doing. And it's uh, there's always new stuff to learn about Frederick Douglass. And um, actually, you mentioned the, the photo there, um, one of my personal favorites, because it has Frank, his dog in there. And I'm a big dog lover, so absolutely love that picture. And we'll talk more about um, uh, Fred Douglas and photography a little bit later today um, in a panel called The Power of the Visuals. So make sure that you tune in for that. And uh, yeah, happy Douglas week, everyone. Thank you, John, for joining us. And uh, we can't thank wait. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. We can't hear, wait to hear more from you. And uh, well, thank you for sharing your research with us today. Thank you, John. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Happy Douglas week. Thank you.